Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome and thanks for joining us for this concurrent session room on youth-led social accountability and activism to improve health outcomes. Concurrent sessions bring together diverse professionals, experiences and perspectives, examine new research, evidence, strategies and practices and engage with peers in emerging issues. We encourage you all to actively participate, ask questions and share ideas with our presenters. Please use the chat box to type in your questions and comments during the presentations. If time allows, a couple of people may be able to use their microphones to participate after each session. However, most likely we'd be using only the chat box to read your questions. In the meantime, please use the chat box. Um, before anything, I want to introduce myself. I'm Edwin Elizabeth Thomas. I'm from India, um, and I'm also part of the Global Planning Committee for GHPC. Our speakers are Kali Simon, Clara Chinorama, Chido Kili Sara Rusike, and Ganesh Pandey from Momentum, Youth Engage, SAF AIDS, and Save the Children Nepal, who will kick off this room's sessions, followed by Christian Mallory, Tumbiko Masiska, Tapiva Olga Montali, and Emmanuel Antonio Martinez from Children International and Care International Malawi. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Kali, Clara, Chido, and Ganesh, who will be presenting on Adolescence and Youth Speak Up, Youth-Led Social Accountability for Family Planning and Reproductive Health. Ms. Simon has 15 years of experience in adolescent youth sexual and reproductive health and has designed and supported the technical strategies of AYSRH programs in more than 15 countries across Latin America, Africa, and South Asia. She currently leads the adolescent sexual and reproductive health team at Save the Children and is the adolescent youth health advisor for Momentum Country and Global Leadership Project. Ms. Clara is a programs officer with three years of experience in adolescent youth sexual reproductive health and rights. And currently she's a focal person at Youth Engage for Her Voice Fund and Simba Utano, which both include youth-led accountability components. Ms. Rusike currently works as a youth professional at the SAF AIDS regional office, focusing on social accountability, policy and advocacy for adolescent and young people's sexual and reproductive health. And last but not least, Mr. Pandey has 14 years of experience in the development sector, especially in the areas of adolescent, maternal, newborn, child health, and nutrition. He's worked for Save the Children in Nepal in several capacities, including technical manager, family health manager, and senior program co coordinator. Over to you, Kelly. Take it away. Thank you so much, and Edwin. Am I clear? Yes. And if you're Great. sharing your screen, now is the perfect time to do yes. it. Yes. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we will be in the first half of the session um, speaking today about Adolescents and Youth Speak Up, Youth-Led Social Accountability for Family Planning and Reproductive Health. And Edwin has done a very nice job of introducing the panelists already, so I will not do that again. Um, we will start by discussing what is youth social accountability and um, why is it critical and important? And it looks like I now can share my screen. So, the, uh, so what is social accountability? We define it as a process of ongoing collective action uh, by civil society groups to hold public officials, service providers, um, and others to account for the provision of quality and equitable health services. And in our presentation, in our session, youth social accountability refers to both youth-led social accountability, meaning it's devised, implemented, and led by young people, and youth-inclusive social accountability, meaning that young people are participating meaningfully, but not necessarily leading or designing the initiative. And youth-led social accountability is essential for improving the way that the health system responds to the needs and rights of adolescents and youth, improving the quality and equity of health services that adolescents and youth receive and reducing the barriers that we know they face, and importantly, promoting youth leadership, meaningful engagement, and positive youth development. Given the importance of youth social accountability for improving health outcomes and youth development, we at Momentum Country and Global Leadership wanted to understand where is youth social accountability is happening what's happening, what are we learning, and how can we improve the practice and the scale of youth social accountability? So we used what we can get to the landscape analysis, and that landscape analysis has actually been released yesterday. I will put a link in the chat box in just a second for all of you. And the landscape analysis used a literature review, key informant interviews, and case studies to answer the questions you can see on your slide. And we thank our partnership with young people for participating in the landscape, as well as the Torchlight Collective who worked with us on this. We looked at how youth have been engaged, outcomes that have been achieved, facilitators and barriers to participation and leadership, and what can be learned from broader social accountability initiatives. We identified 25 youth social accountability initiatives in 33 countries, 
And notably, our key informant interviews showed us that their practice of youth social accountability far outpaces documentation and learning around the initiatives. We noted a range of tools that youth use for social accountability, such as those mentioned on the slide. And we noted that the majority of initiatives were in fact youth inclusive rather than youth led. The full report I'll link to in the chat box, it includes details on the outcomes that were seen, the challenges and opportunities of youth participation, promising practices and recommendations, and we hope you will all check it out. But to make today's session as interesting as possible, we thought we would hear from the young people and the adults involved in youth social account. We are today are facilitating a dialogue between three panelists who've actually participated in and led youth social accountability efforts. We'll talk with Cheeto from the Transforming Lives Project, which implements a digital social accountability initiative whereby young people use an app to register concerns about facility quality and the health system responds to those concerns. Transforming Lives is being implemented in the Southern African region by SAFAIDS with funding support from Sweden. And the program's implementing in six focus countries, Malawi, Lesotho, South Africa, Iswatini, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, and collaborating with the remaining 10 Southern African development community countries. We'll also hear from Ganesh, who has, is, as an adult, has been involved in supporting adolescents through partnership to find quality for adolescents in Nepal, which is an approach that uses dialogue between young people and health service providers to improve the quality of services. This approach is being implemented by Save the Children with funding support from both private funds and USAID. And lastly, we'll talk with Clara from Youth Engage in Zimbabwe. Youth Engage has been involved in several youth social accountability processes, primarily focused on improving the health of adolescent girls and young women. One of their experiences with the Global Fund, Her Voice Fund, where Youth Engage developed an accountability framework with adolescent girls and young women. And Youth Engage is also currently working with ICAD and ICASO on a project called Simba Utano, which aims to improve utilization, delivery, and advocacy of health services by adolescent girls and young women through using a scorecard-based youth-led social accountability approach. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and turn it over for our dialogue process. And I'd like to first turn my attention to asking our panelists what um, their main successes have been in their youth-led social accountability efforts that you've been engaged with. And Chido, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Kelly. Hello, everyone. Um, so um, one of the key successes we have with the social accountability initiative under the Transforming Lives Project was the increased engagement between young people as well as the community district national and even regional leadership so that also um, promoted um, youth leadership amongst the same champions we call them same champions the young people working with um, on the same initiative. And I think one of the other key successes we had was also the integration of technology into the same initiative, which is also sort of um, putting into the whole same uh, the whole same initiative what young people are doing these days using or using of applications and all those so it's sort of like making it user friendly for young people so those are two of our key main successes thank you thanks so much Chido Clara over to you with the same question your your main successes um thank you Kali and um, hello everyone for us as youth engage our main successes um we're fostering adolescent girls' voices, leadership, and agency. Um, after the trainings and the youth-led social accountability, uh, two of our adolescent girls and young women actually managed to attain one of the biggest annual review meetings of the Global Fund, where they presented results based on the data that they had collected in their communities to inform policies and dialogues that happened within Zimbabwe. So that for us was a big win because the advocacy level was being led by the young people themselves. And the other third um, adolescent girl and young to sit and take part in the writing process of the CCM, which is the country coordinating mechanism, where they were demanding a sit part and inform policies and budgeting. Clara, it looks like we're having a little ton of trouble with your connection. I know that this is we were concerned about this. You may want to turn off your video so that you can speed up your bandwidth. 
I think we got the main gist of your successes. So I'll turn to Ganesh and hopefully when we come to our next question, you'll, you'll be clearer coming through. Thank you so much for sharing that um, experience of the, especially the young women being able to represent their communities at such a high level dialogue. Um, Ganesh, over to you for the successes that you've seen with the PDQ process. Thank you, Kelly. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, the key successes in case of Nepal after implementing the PDQ process um, is that the in, uh, there is there was a high chances of uh, increased participation of adolescents and youth in decision making process and improved utilization of sexually reproductive health services. Uh, similarly, the, uh, because of the adolescents' engagement, many health facilities were successfully turned into adolescent friendly health services, health facilities. Structural changes were also observed in many existing health facilities to ensure the availability of separate uh, counseling rooms, privacy, and maintaining confidentiality for adolescents. Flexible hours were applied in health facilities to increase the accessibility and health workers' behavior were unchanged as they came across the adolescents' issues, uh, which were actually identified or raised uh, by the adolescents during the particular process and during the, the bridging gap workshop. Uh, while, while they have live uh, <coughs> charting opportunity, talking opportunities with the health workers and health system. So these are the key successes observed in after implementing PDQ process. Thanks, Ganesh. And since we have you, why don't you go ahead and share um, maybe one challenge that you all experience, and then we'll we'll go to our next panelist. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, uh, uh, while impl implementing the uh, process, we face few challenges uh, like participation and, uh, uh, and leadership of adolescents for a longer period. Skill transfer to new adolescents to develop successor because the uh, adolescents might turn over uh, from uh, quality improvement process because of their priorities like education or migrations, which means adolescents are no longer represent continuously those where, whose capacities were enhanced. Uh, that that was the particular uh, problem challenge we uh, we observed. Thanks, Ganesh. Clara, can we check and see if your audio is working better again, and if you could share with us one of your main challenges? Um, so for us, I think the main challenge uh, that we faced was demystifying the youth-led social the social accountability uh, process in its own because there's little or less documentation around uh, youth-led social account, things to do with ageism, people uh, give a lot of backlash. You want to attack us, you want to expose us. So it's as if they were not really able to express themselves. And we also be happy that to actually bring in local leaders to ensure that they help the process to be smoother. So there's really much work to be done in as much as social accountability is concerned for people to really understand that, no, you know what, this is an opportunity for us to actually have dialogue between young people and the older people in courts um, to ensure that that dialogue happens. So that was a bit of a challenge for us. Thank you, Clara. Yes, we, you were breaking a bit, but we did hear most of it. And I think you, you highlighted on some of the key challenges around ageism and people's receptivity to adolescents holding health systems and decision makers accountable and what a challenge that can be. And you noted in your in your challenge, even a solution to that, which is bringing in some of community leaders to show their support for that process. So thank you. Cheeto, over to you with the same question. Um, I think my... Our main challenge as well is sort of like also um, bridging with what Kelly was also saying, um, sorry, what Clara was also saying with regards to ageism as well as um, the resistance from the adults of the community because um, in regard, in as much as we may, we may want to encourage youth participation and engagement, we, um, there were some instances where we actually faced opposition from the adults in the community as well as the healthcare provision and leadership. So, um, if you if you must know in 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 southern africa and africa in general a young person is mostly at the bottom of the decision making chain that's it, it is instilled in most of us to sort of leave all consultations and related matters to um quote unquote decision makers and it also regulates not asking questions with regards to poor service delivery and misallocation of resources by the government so what we have done as safes with um the mobile tech, uh, application that we have called Mobi Surface was to also um, include like what Clara was saying, include all the community leaders, the healthcare providers from the um, 
the training stage, we included them in everything with regards to this initiative. We trained them on how to use the application, how the application works, what the application is used for, and so that they don't see us as sort of like um, fault finding. We're more or less of trying to help each other to sort of like um, hold policymakers and decision makers accountable for the resources that will be allocated to the young people with regards to their sexual and reproductive health and rights. So that was basically one of our top challenges as well. Thank you so much, Cheeto. That is that's really helpful. It builds on exactly what, what Clara was saying. And I think Ganesh's comments around the challenges with, with young people getting older, as they do. And what how do you sustain an initiative, maintain new youth and engage new adolescents? And and one of the strategies I think for that that we noted in the landscape is is exactly by engaging with youth led organizations and not just individual youth. And I think that's a really helpful comment from Ganesh as well. So we'll move now to what you all um, as young people and adults involved in youth social accountability would recommend to um, to the folks on this call, which I can see we are about 66 people and it looks like we're a mix of donors and implementers, young people, um, researchers. What would you all recommend for you know accelerating um, youth social accountability? And Clara, let's start with you in hopes that we get a good connection. We're not hearing you, Clara. So Cheeto, I'll go to you and we'll come back to Clara at the end and maybe we'll have a better connection. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so from even this conversation, one of the key um, problems or even issues that we're having is this lack of documentation of the same initiatives in whichever country that we're implementing in. So I think one of the recommendations I'll have is let's document, documentation, documentation, documentation. I cannot emphasize this enough uh, because they're not documented because um, resulting in little evidence and learning platforms and practices to help improve future and even present initiatives with regards to social accountability. We need to document the impact of social accountability on the young people themselves, service delivery, as well as any other facets of the initiative like community participation, political and local leadership involvement in the same efforts. Documentation will also maybe show us how initiatives are, are being implemented in ways also on how to unpack um, the power concepts within our communities, with be, be it the traditional, the cultural, even the religious society that we all live in. So I think um, documentation is one of the critical things with regards to social accountability. If we can document more, then I think we'll have uh, much better initiatives in the future. Thank you, Chido. Um, Ganesh, over to you for your recommendation. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, yeah, because the, the, the challenge we faced was uh, the turnover of evaluations from the quality improvement team. So one of the recommendations that I, I feel is that to develop the successor as the trend ones might move away because of their priority is out or due to other reasons. This, uh, this, this program needs to be linked with the existing, uh, you know, child clubs or the youth clubs uh, available in the, in, in, the, in the communities to make it sustainable. And another approach uh, uh, we, we, we learned is that uh, the strengthening of uh, local health facility management and operation committees uh, and linking with the uh, ASRS programs with them. And that, that will be the uh, key uh, uh, recommendation from my side uh, to make the program success. Thanks, Ganesh. And Clara, let's see if we can try again. Uh, my recommendation would be that we need a multi-sexual approach uh, by integrating um, youth-led social accountability in existing structures within our government. Because I think the problem really has been that social accountability has been treated as a silo, as something that is totally new into the game. But instead, it can actually be integrated and prioritized in the budgeting processes of all governments. This also implies that collaboration with donors, with civil society organizations needs to be prioritized with young people being part of those processes. So we really need to think along the lines of budgeting, collaboration, and having that multi-sectoral approach. Thank you so much, Clara, Chido, and Ganesh. Um, we will we will move to questions from their speakers in just a minute. Um, so for those of you who are listening in, if you would like to chat a few questions in the box, we'll, we'll be taking those. Well, before we do that, what I would like to do is I'd like to just um, link what our colleagues, Clara, Chido, and Ganesh have said to what we found in the landscape analysis that I've linked to in the chat box. So we looked across 25 initiatives and, and what, what our colleagues have shared today really resonates across all 25 of those initiatives. And in fact, 
we came out looking at um, at those initiatives with four major recommendations, which we've which we've basically heard here today. The first one is around increasing the support for monitoring, evaluation, learning, and documentation of youth-led social accountability efforts so that we can understand how to get better how to and what impacts that it has on young people and on health systems. Prioritizing investment in youth-led organizations as opposed to kind of creating standalone and separate entities for social accountability so that we can be more sustainable and um, have that pipeline of young people to participate as youth age out and investing in social accountability initiatives that target multiple levels of the health system and supporting the health system to respond to young people, as Ganesh was saying, through the Ministry of Health and strengthening the capacity of providers all the way up the chain. And then lastly, we recommend that we've seen an overemphasis on tools. And tools are really important for young people to use apps, um, scorecards, they're, they're fantastic, but how can we shift and ensure that we're supporting true youth movements um, for accountability so that they're sustained beyond the use of any one tool and recognizing that tool is just part of a much larger process. So those are the four recommendations that we came out of the review with and which I think resonate so nicely with what we heard from our young colleagues today. We'll move now to taking a few questions from the audience. Um, we have about five minutes left, I think, for questions for our session. And I saw that there was one that came through from Camden um, about speaking about the possible challenges of adapting, you know, PDQY or let's say um, any youth social accountability approach in fragile settings, such as South Sudan or in the midst of COVID-19. So I don't know if, um, if, if maybe I've, if any of our speakers want to speak about how it might be adaptable considering the context of either a fragile setting or or COVID-19. Ganesh, do we want to start with you? And then and then maybe Cheeto might add something given the the, the current programming is happening in the context of COVID-19. So Ganesh, you first. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, considering the current uh, COVID context, uh, engaging um, young people is, is a kind of challenge, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, looking at the alternative means, how we can uh, improve the, 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 how we can in ensure the uh, uh, young people participation uh, in, in, in discussion might be using the virtual means or uh, telephone or, uh, you know, other, other, other means available in the, in, the, in the communities might be helpful. Uh, here we are doing the same, uh, engaging um, uh, young people in, in the decision-making process or raising the voices or, for, for instance, let's say the uh, local health uh, government or municipalities or what you know, structures uh, allocating, uh, need, uh, should have allocated resources to have uh, a relation-friendly structure. So they raise their voices through, you know, link, Zoom links or through other, other alternate means. Uh, so we can link with them with the with the uh, uh, telephone or with other means, and if possible, in a small scale, by maintaining all uh, universal precautions of health safety, uh, we can organize a small gathering, a small meetings, uh, uh, maintaining all precautionary measures. Uh, that will also helpful uh, during um, that. That can be also done during the COVID context as well. Uh, because that also gives messages to young people to how 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 to be safe from uh, COVID uh, virus or how to be safe from this uh, present condition and also uh, how to engage in this uh, situation because that this is the scary moment for uh, young people because of lack of uh, adequate information to them. So engaging by using alternate technologies and uh, the maintaining um, is gathering small group discussion. Uh, in, in communities by maintaining, uh, you, you know, uh, safety measures might be helpful. Thank you, Ganesh. Uh, Cheeto, did you want to complement that with your experiences using technology? And I see there's a comment in the chat box about the power of technology um, in youth social accountability. So I think Cheeto might have quite a bit to say on that. Um, thank you, Kelly. Uh, so I think basically what Ganesh said is generally what we're, all, we're also facing. There was no physical movement and also access to services at the health facilities was um, little to none. So basically what our same champions were doing, we're going to the communities with the uh, mobile application, trying to encourage people to register on the applications that they know that the application still works regardless of the pandemic. So even if you're in the comfort of your own home and you go to a facility that is um, 
um, giving out sexual reproductive health services and you don't receive um, quality health services, you could always use the application in the comfort of your own home without necessarily having to go to look for a same champion who is based at the clinic or who is um, in another district. So um, the technology aspect of it all means that during the COVID pandemic, you can always uh, minimize movement and ensure that we're all um, living within the guidelines um, being um, given by the, the respective countries and not necessarily having to move around to the same champions or to the service providers to issue your, your complaint or to issue a ticket on the Mobi Surface application. So I think the technology has all um, breached that gap, I think. Thank you so much, Chido. Um, and Ganesh, I see that we have um, only about a minute late remaining. I do see the request for the four recommendations that we mentioned, and I will paste those in the chat box in just a minute when we're done when we're done speaking. So those will be in the chat box. They are also found in the report that I linked to, and I could link to again. I saw just one final comment here around, you know, engaging parents, faith-based organizations, and also the intergenerational gap. And I, and then a question on how we measure social accountability. The measurement of social accountability, I think, is a, is a complex one and one that we is the, the field is evolving and thinking about. I wondered, um, so we might not have time to get into that right this second, but I did wonder if Clara, if your audio was working, if you wanted to comment about the engaging of parents and faith based organizations and bridging the intergenerational gap. Yes, um, parents are a very key stakeholder in all the processes that we, we do because we are working with adolescent girls and young women who are coming directly from home and they're in the community. So whenever we start these conversations, we ensure that we engage with the parents, we engage with the local leadership, especially here in Africa. To, traditional leaders have a key role in influencing processes. So you do not want to jump that process and directly work with adolescent girls and young women or youths in general alone. So you have to ensure that they really understand why we are doing this and have uh, the backup and support that you need from them. So we never leave them behind. They are a very critical stakeholder in the process and we are continuously looking into ways in which we can improve collaboration with them. Wonderful. Thank you, Clara. And with that, that was a wonderful last word, I think. So we'll wrap up our portion of the session and we look forward to the next speakers. Um, we'll put our contact information in the box and any further questions you all may have, please do reach out. And thank you so much um, to Ganesh, Clara and Chido. Uh, thank you, Kelly. And thank you to this wonderful first uh, panel. Uh, I want our participants to stay with us for our next presentation led by Christian Mallory, Tumbiko Masiska, Tapiva Olga Montali, and Emmanuel Antonio Martinez of Children International and Care International Malawi, who will be presenting on enhancing youth engagement and activism using community scorecard to lead improvements in adolescent health and well-being. Uh, for this segment, we actually have simultaneous translation in Spanish and English available. It should be there at the bottom of your screen. Um, I want to introduce the speakers. Kristen Mallory, with over 10 years of international public health experience, leads global initiatives focused on optimizing local resources to ensure children and youth have access to essential health services in 10 countries across the Americas, Africa, and Asia. Uh, Kristen led the partnership at Children International with CSE Consulting Group to adapt and scale CARE's community scorecard approach at Children International with teams around the world. Uh, Tumbeko Masisko was part of the team that developed the community scorecard at CARE in 2002. He now is a technical director of the CSE Consulting Group, which is a social enterprise established to amplify impact and scale of the CSE within Malawi, where the group is based and around the world. Tapiva Olga Mantali is the community scorecard technical coordinator and junior consultant. She has a proven record of adopting paper-based social accountability tool to a digital platform and rollout in adaptation to COVID-19. And last but not the least, Emmanuel Martinez is an industrial engineering student at UNIPEC Dominican Republic with a focus on social and commercial enterprises. In 2018, he was trained by Children National and Care Malawi to implement the community scorecard to improve health services, which he continues to lead in his community. I'm also proud to have a youth leader here with us. Over to you, Christian. Great, thank you so much, Edwin. Um, just to reinforce the simultaneous translation, it will be important to select a language, whether English or Spanish, because our panel will be in both languages. So please find that at the bottom bar and click there. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so big thanks to our colleagues for kicking off this important topic. We hope to build upon what was shared. 
we are going to explore how the CSC or the Community Scorecard, a social accountability approach developed by CARE Malawi, effectively connects the youth development sector with health to create opportunities and spaces for youth to lead, lead positive change for their health and well being. And before we start, we would like to um, kick off with a poll. So, Edwin, if you can launch that now, a question is going to pop up in your screen. And we'd just like to get a sense of how familiar you are with the community scorecard. So take a couple seconds. Okay, so the results should show up on your screen. Looks like we have a nice um, span of experience here. So some have never heard of it. That's fine. That's not a requirement for today's session. Um, some have heard of it, um, but are maybe interested in learning more. We have some um, participants who are quite familiar and maybe those who have even implemented it or something similar. So we're excited to hear that um, and hoping for a fruitful discussion. I'm Kristen Mallory. I'm from Children International, as Edwin already shared, and I'm accompanied by a great group of colleagues and friends who are going to bring this topic to life as we share the story of how the Community Scorecard brought us all together. So you've already heard the bios, but just quickly, Tapiwa um, is the coordinator for the Community Scorecard. Um, she also has experience adapting it, um, the CSC, to a digital platform um, given the pandemic. Emmanuel from the Dominican Republic has experienced both implementing the Community Scorecard in his own community and leading a youth-led social accountability um, through the Community Scorecard with Children International. And Tumbiko is our social accountability expert on the panel, um, leads the, the CSC consulting group and has traveled the globe sharing his experience around what has, he's learned in Malawi to extrapolate to other countries, including um, Children International in Latin America. So welcome to all three of you. Quickly to start, Children International works in health, education, youth development, and employment across 10 countries and has a rich experience in positive youth development programs. We take a life, -based, life skills based approach based on the WHO's 10 essential life skills and see youth as partners in programming and development as opposed to recipients of it. We capitalize on youth strengths through programs that use mediums such as art, journalism, sport, and financial, social and financial literacy and project management to enhance life skills and provide opportunities to use those skills for positive change. In 2019, youth development programming to enhance life skills and social responsibility reached over 60,000 young people. And here's an image we use at Children International that we refer to as the empowerment journey. And as you can see, there are different mediums such as sport for development, music, arts, et cetera. And these really serve as vehicles to enhance life skills. The life skills, which you can see within the vehicle um, are kind of like the gasoline that's really used to fuel development. Emmanuel has been a leader in his community and a partner with Children International. Emmanuel, can you tell us a bit about some of the skills and experience you gained from these youth leadership programs? Sí, claro. A propósito de lo que decía Cristi, este, yo formé parte de Children International desde muy pequeño, pero lo que me trae esta ocasión es hablarles sobre las habilidades que pude adquirir durante los años que estuve participando en los programas de empoderamiento. Puedo decir que desde 2016 he participado en estos programas y donde tuve la oportunidad de implementar proyectos e iniciativas sociales que me permitieron a través de estas acciones generar habilidades y destrezas que hoy puedo decir que sé aplicarlas y que puedo llevarlas a la vida diaria. Los cambios que pude identificar en mí fueron fenomenales en cuanto a habilidades de comunicación, trabajo en equipo, estrategia, proyectos sociales y trabajo con la comunidad sobre todo. Dichos cambios que hoy puedo decirles que los utilizo y que esas habilidades me han permitido a mí como persona crecer, pero también servir desde otras plataformas sociales como no exactamente Children International, sino otras plataformas como Rotary, Rotarac y otras para ayudar a mi comunidad. Thank you, Emmanuel, for sharing some of the specific skills that were enhanced and leveraged throughout your participation. Tumbiko, as part of the group at CARE that developed the Community Scorecard and now part of the consulting group that aims to train others in this approach and continue to enhance it, particularly for those in the audience who haven't heard about the, 
the community scorecard, can you give us your elevator speech or a quick summary of what it is? And then share some of the key skills um, in order to facilitate this approach effectively. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Christian. So in, 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 indeed, uh, CARE is established the Community Scorecard Consulting Group. And uh, CARE is an international organization that uh, has uh, actually works uh, to fight poverty and social justice. And uh, the community voice is very critical to this work. As such, we developed this approach called the Community Scorecard. The idea now is uh, for the consulting group is to uh, scale up uh, the impact and, if, uh, and effectiveness and reach of the uh, Community Scorecard. This is based on the last experience that we've had and also uh, the evaluation that we've done. We noted that many other things are not the best implemented uh, so that it yields the results. That's why we started this group so that we can provide support to others. You may be wondering, what's the community scorecard? This is an approach that uh, brings rice holders and duty bearers uh, to into a conversation that identifies the bottlenecks to service delivery and service utilization. With an idea of now identifying key solutions that can be implemented to change the status quo. And uh, these groups, they do implement together jointly. And at the same time, they do hold each other to account. You may note that uh, uh, the Community Scorecard recognizes the uh, social differences that would exist in the community. As such, even the most marginalized groups have a space to participate in and have their voices and their priorities are shared in the conversation. So what are the key enhancers to uh, the success of the Community Scorecard? The approach requires adequate time as it's not a once-off kind of event. It is a iterative uh, process that is done almost every six months. And the success of it indeed requires buy-in from uh, various actors. And it requires understanding uh, of those that are facilitating the process of the governance uh, arrangements in the particular area where they are implementing this approach. So for instance, in the agriculture sector, you need to understand what are the governance arrangements uh, in terms of the levels of decision making uh, in that particular uh, locality. It would also be good if you have uh, a supportive political environment that would be guaranteed of uh, success. And for the team that is uh, facilitating this process, they really need to be uh, well skilled and the skills can be attained. And they, have, they need to have the Thank you, Tumbiko, um, for that summary and also um, honing in on some of the skills that are important and things to consider when implementing. In 2018, the consulting group led by Tumbiko trained Children International on this approach and conducted pilots in both the Dominican Republic and Guatemala as a way to improve access to quality health services. Emmanuel, you were part of this pilot at Children International and have continued to support the effort in your own community and have begun to, let, to lead a youth-led community scorecard funded by the United Nations Development Program. Can you tell us a bit about what this work looked like and how it built off of what you had done in previous youth projects? Sí, claro. Como ya especificó Kristen, este, en 2018 participé de, del programa de formación en tarjeta de calificación comunitaria que nos dio Tumbico. Hasta ese entonces, y desde ahí yo pude participar en procesos, implementar y facilitar dichos procesos. Sin embargo, a finales de 2019 me llega la propuesta de participar en un proyecto con el Programa de las Naciones Unidas para el Desarrollo, PNUD, donde tendría que implementar o liderar la tarjeta de calificación comunitaria, pero esta vez con una particularidad especial, y es que querían que fuera enfocada a jóvenes, o sea, garantizar servicios amigables de salud para jóvenes. Para mí, esto fue toda una experiencia, fue un reto. De hecho, eh, me gustó mucho porque vi la, la perspectiva distinta y el enfoque que tienen los jóvenes de, de ver las cosas y así como también de proponer soluciones a estas. En cuanto a los jóvenes, ellos se enfocaban mucho en temas de confidencialidad, trato al usuario, sinceridad y todos estos temas que son muy cualitativos y que tienen que ver mucho con la consulta directa que recibe el paciente con el joven. Pero también ellos tenían mucho miedo a la exposición, repito, el nivel de exposición que estos tenían al momento de enfrentarse a una consulta de salud. Muchos de ellos no les gustaba asistir a, a las consultas 
Y a diferencia de los adultos, de grupos en los que he trabajado, en donde la mayoría de las personas o la parte predominante es representada por adultos, estos se enfocaban en, en temas de infraestructura, ubicación y, y cómo llegar y el acceso a la salud, a diferencia de los jóvenes que, como ya dije, se enfocaban en temas muy cualitativos. Es importante también destacar que los jóvenes se sintieron escuchados durante todo este proceso, se sintieron valorados, escuchados y, y de hecho ellos presentaron acciones, propuestas para hacer acciones para mejorar los servicios de salud en su comunidad. Esto nos quiere decir que, que ellos presentaron, ellos validaron propuestas, verificaron acciones, visitaron el centro médico, pero también hicieron un plan de trabajo enfocado y, y, y esto es todo un aprendizaje. De hecho, lo que más a mí me emocionó y me sorprendió de todo esto fue el hecho de una propuesta muy específica, que puede ser pequeña si la vemos, pero tiene para mí un valor muy importante. Y fue la propuesta de, de implementar consultorios enfocados para jóvenes dentro de las unidades de atención primaria en República Dominicana. En este caso, ellos proponían un consultorio médico exclusivo para jóvenes, donde tuvieran un, un doctor o un médico que sepa con la población que está tratando, pero que también comprenda que esta población tiene necesidades distintas por los mismos temas que ya mencioné. Ellos se enfocan mucho en cosas cualitativas, tienen miedo al nivel de exposición que reciben durante una consulta. Entonces, es parte de nosotros evaluar qué que nos conviene más. Que, que el, el paciente tenga confianza con el doctor que le está atendiendo o que tenga miedo al nivel de exposición que recibe o simplemente establecemos políticas específicas para este tipo de necesidad. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Emeril, for sharing. Um, it's great to see the youth's ability to work in multiple levels within the health system um, and being able to advocate for a health service that is tailored um, to the specific needs of youth is really exciting. Dumbico, any reactions to what Emmanuel shared? How does this compare to what you've seen in Malawi and other places where you've worked? Well, I, I'm actually impressed to uh, see youth like Emmanuel taking leadership in confronting problems that affect them. You know, in many countries, we've seen youth implementing the, like the community scorecard and other social accountability approaches as a way to mobilize key stakeholders. And these stakeholders are not just uh, community members or youth themselves, but even uh, authorities uh, from the service provider side and even higher level, like the district level, even the national level, to engage in conversations to identify solutions uh, to the call of action. So it's not just the main discussion as they engage them to all that they can find up steps and they also uh, support implementation or the tech leadership in the implementation of those actions. So for instance, in Malawi, we see youth. We're losing you again, Tumbiko. How about we come back to you, Tumbiko, because um, I'd love to get Tapiwa included into the conversation. Um, you bring a lot of experience at working with youth and really leveraging their abilities for social change. Um, can you tell us a bit about your experience with the social, uh, with the community scorecard and what have been some of the challenges and opportunities you've seen and learned along the way? Thank you, Kristen. Um, I think one of the biggest highlights and how far the youth are willing to go with uh, tools like the community scorecard. Um, they work hard and they push until they see uh, results. They have changed their communities in so many ways. Clinics have been built, health centers have been renovated, water has, running water has been brought to their clinics, youth-friendly health services have been prioritized, all for the youth-led community scorecard. I find that um, given the opportunity and the space to escalate their concerns past district level to national levels, life would con uh, lives would continue to be changed. Um, the biggest outcry I'd say from the youth has been that larger organizations consult their youth here and there, identify their needs, but uh, end up missing the mark when it comes to programming. Um, I believe that 
for in and in some cases i believe that there's a need to re, you know i believe that there's a need to regard um youth as subject matter experts that need to be engaged at the beginning of ideation and brainstorming phases of project development for programming that affects the youth i've noted that the youth that csc allows youth to do exactly that identify a need bring appropriate stakeholders together to discuss and jointly recommend satisfactory actions in which they, the youth, can also um, monitor and ensure that they come to pass. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tapiwa. Can you tell us about the youth in this photo? Yes, um, the youth in this photo are a group called uh, Jigodi Youth Group in Malawi, and they invited CARE International to come and observe and just witness an interface meeting that they had uh, called for in their community. And the same group is the one I was talking about, who which have um, initiated changes in their community using the community scorecard. So they've brought water to their facility. They've been um, very key in bringing a building and outreach under five clinic. They've ensured that youth friendly services are available to them in terms of accessing family planning services. And in the photo, uh, somebody said a joke and it was the right moment to take the picture. <laughs> I can feel the energy and I think all of us who've had the opportunity to work with youth know that that energy is quite contagious. Yes. <laughs> so Emmanuel and Tapia, as you know, the world has changed a lot since both of you started this work. What role do you believe um, youth could play in the response to COVID-19 pandemic building off of the community scorecard? Tapia, do you want to start? Um, yes, since the pandemic, we have been different ways of uh, to continue to amplify the youth voice, one of which has uh, meant to be effective was through a remote community scorecard run by uh, USSD platform. So they were able to send SMSs to this platform. And this platform allowed the youth to report any service delivery issues concerning adolescent sexual and reproductive health, as well as um, COVID-19. And they were able to receive feedback from district officials through an interface meeting that was done via radio call-in programs. Um, however, in the past, uh, the youth have been able to conduct the entire CSC uh, process um, on their own, bring together duty bearers to task. But the pandemic has posed a huge challenge in that they cannot um, call for community gatherings and the technological incapacities make it difficult for them to conduct a remote community scorecard on their own without support from organizations like CARE. Um, I feel that there's a need to explore ways in which the youth voice can continue to be amplified um, in this uh, pandemic uh, with minimal face-to-face -face interaction. Definitely a barrier that we're all trying to program around right now. So something that um, I think is of interest to a lot of us and would be great to talk about further. Emmanuel, would you like to add any suggestions in terms of youth's response? Sí, claro. Mira, este, la pandemia realmente ha representado para todos un reto. No es una mentira, una realidad para nadie que esto nos encontró de sorpresa a todos. Jóvenes, adultos, gobiernos, instituciones y empresas. Sin embargo, yo puedo verlo como una oportunidad para que los jóvenes puedan integrarse de una forma activa al sistema. Dejar de ser parte del problema porque todos nosotros somos parte de una u otra forma de este problema llamado coronavirus y comenzar a ser parte de las soluciones. Entiendo que hay que potenciar una necesidad que tenemos los jóvenes, y es que tenemos la necesidad de ser escuchados. Nos gusta que nos escuchen, pero también ser tomados en cuenta. Fíjense en esa foto que ven ahí en pantalla que nos están proyectando. Ninguno de esos jóvenes llegan a 21 años de edad. Y cuando yo veo las soluciones que estos pudieron proponer, que posiblemente a otras personas de otras edades no se les hubieran, no se les hubieran eh, interesado hacer. Yo digo, en la juventud hay talentos, en la juventud hay ideas que pueden realmente solucionar problemas para todos. Les repito, los jóvenes tenemos la necesidad de ser escuchados, pero tienen, tenemos también que ser tomados en cuenta. Creo que ya es la hora de dejar de escuchar estas palabras que dicen, no es tu tiempo, aún eres joven, y cambiar esto por decir, Somos el futuro, por ese futuro se construye desde ahora y es trabajando. Entonces la pandemia coronavirus creo que, que representa una oportunidad para que los jóvenes podamos proponer soluciones locales, porque si bien es, la pandemia es algo global, 
pero entiendo que la forma de atacarla correctamente es proponiendo soluciones locales, ya que cada comunidad tiene circunstancias diferentes y características. Y por tanto, entonces, las medidas que podamos proponer no deben ser las mismas para todos. No todas las comunidades tienen la, las mismas limitaciones. Entonces, la juventud es un pilar de las comunidades. La juventud está ahí, quiere ser escuchada. Y si ustedes le dan la oportunidad a través de herramientas y plataformas como estas, que son la Community Scorecard, la tarjeta de calificación comunitaria, que potencia el empoderamiento en la comunidad, pero también da oportunidad a los jóvenes en igualdad de condiciones, porque de hecho esto es una de las cosas que más me ha gustado de esa herramienta. Y es que todos somos iguales, no hay edades. Yo aprendí con la TCC a trabajar con grupos de diferentes edades y eliminar los perjuicios. Entonces, les repito, la juventud es el futuro, pero ese futuro se construye ahora y trabajando. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. And very much in agreement that the time is now. We need new voices, new ideas. And the Community Scorecard, as you mentioned, is really a great opportunity and tool to provide that space um, for youth to um, contribute to what they think is needed in the health system and the broader community. So it's a great platform for that. Tumbiko, I don't know how your internet's doing. Do you want to add to any of the comments that were just shared with Tapiwa and the Mama? So indeed, I, I think for me, uh, looking at how the youths are engaging, like in the country like Malawi, Rwanda, and the uh, Dominican Republic, uh, assuming the leadership law in implementing such approaches, which are meant to address the challenges that the youth are, are facing, I think it's a, it's a call to practitioners to ensure that uh, we intentionally now partner with uh, the youth to advance the changes that uh, are going to benefit them. So engaging them as critical partners, not necessarily just involving them as uh, uh, mayor participants, but uh, letting them be actively engaged and uh, leading decision making, leading the particular kind of action that will be critical to uh, realize the change that we want. Thank you. Thank you, Tumbiko. So we have a couple minutes left for, to take a few questions from the group. There's a question about in successfully engaging religious leaders, um, how they have been involved in youth and adolescent needs. Um, does, does anyone on our panel have an experience that they can share that connected religious leaders to this process? Um, yes, I have um, an example that I can share that has happened in Chile with the youth groups. Um, we've had in, um, the youth conducting community scorecard in different areas to do with family planning, which can um, bring about faith issues um, or bring about issues with um, faith religious leaders in their community um, and their opinions of adolescents accessing sexual and reproductive health services. And there's been a need for, we've learned from that experience that there's been a, uh, what is important is to have a lot of buy-in and I have a lot of buy-in and sometimes adjust the adolescent so, um, services to services that they are approving of. And some of these could be, um, they need talks on abstinence and they use the faith-based leaders are more um, attuned to, to preaching about um, abstinence and things like that. But it requires a lot of um, buy-in at the beginning to explain to them what exactly you're trying to um, to do and how they can play a role in, in enhancing whatever issue you're trying to address. Thank you, Tapila. There's also a question in the chat about how participants can access these materials. So Tumbiko, if I'm not mistaken, the manual is open access for the community scorecard. Um, and the Community Scorecard Consulting Group is also a great research, uh, a great resource um, for technical support. And I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add to that, Tumbiko, in terms of directing people to get more information. Yes, I think in addition to that, we also have our email addresses uh, shared at the end of the presentation. So we can reach directly to me and Tapua. Thank you. We'll drop in the uh, chat. Sounds good. And with that, a half hour is, is uh, limiting, uh, but we
we wanted to start the conversation, um, but we hope to continue the conversation with you all. So here is our contact information. Please reach out, please look for us um, in the remainder of the conference. As Emmanuel and my other colleagues shared, the time is now more than ever to really bring, um, unlock the potential of youth, bring their voices to the forefront um, to tackle these really unprecedented issues in the world we're living in. Um, so we'd love to do that together because that is a problem that can't sol be solved by any one organization. So with that, I will turn it back over to Edwin and thank you all so much for being with us this morning. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, Kelly. I want to thank the presenters and all our participants for such a rich and insightful discussion on youth-led social accountability and activism. Um, a special word of thanks to our interpreters, Angelina and Gabrielle. And as we conclude the session, please head back to the conference website to join the marketplace sessions. I'm putting the link in the chat uh, right now.